delve into the psyche of a merciless predator, as we expose the depths of his malevolence and the sorrow that echoed through the hearts he callously shattered. Brace yourself for a journey into the darkest corners of human nature, where deception and horror collide, and discover the horrifying legacy of Harry Powers, the Lonely Hearts Killer. The man who would come to be known as Harry Powers was born Herman Drenth in the Netherlands in 1892. When he was 18, his parents moved their family to America in search of a better life. After spending time in Iowa and Wisconsin, the clan settled in the small, idyllic city of Clarksburg, West Virginia. Though not wealthy by anyone's definition, Herman's father managed to scrape together enough money to purchase some farmland in the hope of starting a family business. In his mind, with both he and the children working the fields, they would turn a profit in no time. Unfortunately for his pie-in-the-sky father, Herman had no interest in being a farmer, or work in general for that matter. Although he was barely out of his teens, he had already served time in Wisconsin for burglary. Undeterred by having been caught in the act, he had made up his mind early on that stealing was a much better way to make a living than trying to hold down a job. The only obstacle standing in his way was that he wasn't very good at either. The only thing that Herman knew for sure was that he was meant to live a life of leisure, he just had to figure out how to make his ambitions a reality. The avenue he ended up choosing would be a road paved with heartbreak. After putting much thought into it, Herman decided that being a capped man was the life for him. With this goal in mind, he set out looking for a woman of means who wouldn't mind devoting herself and her money to someone who wouldn't hit a lick at a snake. In 1927, Herman hit the jackpot when he met Luella Struther through an ad she had placed in a publication called Lonely Hearts Magazine. A homeowner and proprietor of a successful grocery store, she was financially stable and completely self-sufficient. The only thing missing in her life was someone with whom to share her good fortune. Unfortunately for her, that someone turned out to be Herman Trent. While he may not have been everyone's cup of tea, Luella was instantly smitten with Herman's Dutch accent and icy blue eyes. Following a whirlwind courtship, the couple married and began their journey as husband and wife. Even though Luella's income more than met their needs, theirs wasn't exactly the lavish lifestyle Herman had envisioned. An opportunist by nature, he knew from the hours he had spent scouring Lonely Hearts ads that there was a seemingly endless supply of women out there just waiting for someone to sweep them off their feet. To sweeten the pot, most of them were well off, if not downright rich. In no time at all, he had weaved a plan that would enable him to enjoy the finer things in life without ever having to lift a finger. He would correspond with as many single ladies as time would allow, earn their trust, and take them for everything they were worth before casting them aside. Of course, this would all be done on the sly with his wife, and number one cash cow Luella, never the wiser. Shiftless to the core, Herman also began placing his own ads in the hope that lonely women would come to him, which would require less effort on his part. Since he didn't dare use his real name, he adopted the pseudonym Harry Powers. And, with that, a monster was born. The letters that Herman, now Harry, penned were flowery and filled with lies. He wrote of his profound loneliness and desire to be loved. He claimed to be the owner of a palatial estate who had over a hundred thousand dollars, around one million seven hundred thousand dollars today, in the bank and no one to share it with. How the paper kept from combusting is anyone's guess. Needless to say, the ruse worked like a charm. Before he knew it, the replies were pouring in. Even on slow days, he would receive upwards of a dozen letters, all from women eager to keep company with the eloquent gentleman who seemed to be perfect in every way, at least on paper. At some point, Harry had taken a break from his secret life to oversee construction of a garage on the property he shared with his wife. For reasons that would come to light later on, he requested that a basement be dug underneath the structure. Trusting to a fault, Luella hadn't questioned his actions. As far as she was concerned, they got along splendidly, and she had no desire to rock the boat. Once the project was completed, Harry resumed corresponding with women from all over the country. To keep things fresh, he had created yet another persona, that of Cornelius O. Pearson. It was under this new identity that he began a long-distance relationship with a widow named Asta Iker. At the time, Asta was living in Illinois with her three young children. 
To her surprise, one day in the summer of 1931, Cornelius had shown up on her doorstep insisting that she come away with him so they could get to know each other better. Excited at the prospect, she had asked her friend Elizabeth Abernathy to look after her children while she was gone. After hugging them and telling them goodbye, the hopeful single mother had left arm in arm with a man who was little more than a stranger. Her young family watched from the front stoop as she drove away, unaware that they would never see her again. Weeks passed with no word from Asta until one day when Elizabeth received a letter from Cornelius. In it, he informed her that he would be arriving in Illinois in a few days to pick up the children so that they could be reunited with their mother, who he claimed was now living with his family in Europe. Although she had trouble believing that her friend would leave the country without letting anyone know, Elizabeth had kept her doubts to herself. On the day that Cornelius came to collect the children, she had handed them over without a word of protest. As soon as he had them in his possession, Cornelius had driven straight to their mother's bank where he sent the oldest child in to cash a check that had been written on her account. Things quickly went south when the teller refused a request on the grounds that the signature had been forged. Rather than pressing his luck, Cornelius had fled the state with three very confused children that were not his own in tow. In the weeks that followed, Elizabeth Abernathy would try on numerous occasions to find out what became of Asta and her children. When she was finally able to reach Cornelius, he assured her that the family was well and living in Europe. Despite his claims, she couldn't shake the feeling that they had met with foul play. Suspicion grew when a man named William O'Boyle, who rented a room in Asta's house, came forward to say that he had seen Cornelius rummaging through her belongings shortly after her disappearance. When confronted, he had run out the door without uttering a word. When O'Boyle notified the authorities, they quickly brought the mysterious Cornelius Pearson in for questioning. When asked if he knew the whereabouts of the Iker family, he claimed that they were living somewhere in Colorado. He was even able to produce documents to back up this new version of events. A smooth talker even under pressure, he had avoided a burglary charge by saying that Asta had given him permission to enter her former residence as he saw fit. Even though no charges were filed against him, the incident had put him on police radar. Tired of dealing with the headaches that were associated with the name Cornelius Pearson, he reverted back to being the lesser-known Harry Powers. Eager to put the episode in Illinois behind him, he had already moved on to his next conquest, a Massachusetts woman by the name of Dorothy Lemke. After falling hard for the refined gentleman who had answered her plea for companionship, Dorothy packed up her things and prepared to board a train bound for Iowa, where her suitor claimed to own a home. Before departing, she had withdrawn $4,000 from her bank account at his request. When he picked her up at the station, Harry had greeted Dorothy with a smile and a warm embrace before asking if she remembered to bring the money. After pocketing the cash, he had proposed to her on the spot, an offer she happily accepted. Right from the start, red flags had been flying everywhere, but Dorothy was too blinded by love to see. Among them was the fact that her husband-to-be had shipped the trunks containing most of her worldly possessions to West Virginia, not Iowa. He had also tagged them using the name Cornelius Pearson instead of Harry Powers. Rather than asking questions, Dorothy had kept quiet, just as he knew she would. In August of 1931, two months after Asta and her children were last seen, police in Park Ridge, Illinois finally started looking into their disappearances. While searching the house they once occupied, investigators discovered 27 love letters, all of which had been written by Cornelius Pearson. The correspondences were eventually traced to Clarksburg, West Virginia. The address used to obtain the post office box from which the letters had been mailed was that of Harry Powers, a local citizen of the highest standing. When he was picked up for questioning in connection with the fate of the Iker family, Harry had five love letters on his person, each one addressed to a different woman. As things heated up, a search warrant was served on the home that Harry, whom they now knew was actually Herman Trent, shared with his wife Luella. The residence was gone over with a fine-tooth comb, but no evidence of wrongdoing was found. Even so, Herman's days of preying on women were about to come to an end. When officers turned their attention to the garage that had long been Herman's private sanctuary, they found more than they bargained for. While the above-ground space revealed nothing of importance, the basement proved to be the lair of a sadistic monster. After gaining access through a trapdoor, 
investigators discovered four torture rooms. Bloody clothing and debris littered the floors of the macabre chambers. The walls were smeared with dried blood, some of which was embedded with human hair. A partially burnt bank book bearing Asta's name was found in the rubble, leaving little doubt as to her fate. Worst of all, a child's bloody footprints were visible on the cement floor. In the ensuing days, other areas of the property were excavated in an effort to locate the remains of those who had perished in the garage. After some digging, the bodies of Asta and her three children were unearthed. A fourth victim was also found. The skeletal remains would later be identified as those of Dorothy Lemke. During the course of the investigation, it was determined that Asta and her daughters Greta and Annabelle had been strangled, while her son had been bludgeoned to death with a hammer. Dorothy Lemke had also been strangled, as evidenced by the belt that was still wrapped tightly around what was left of her neck. Another alarming discovery was a cache of love letters that Herman's alter egos Harry and Cornelius were still sending and receiving on a regular basis. When detectives perused the writings, they learned that their suspect had been making arrangements to introduce several other unsuspecting women to the horrors that awaited in the garage. From what they could gather, he was only getting warmed up at the time of his arrest. It was surmised that Herman had killed Asta after taking her from her home in June. Having developed a taste for killing, he had returned for the children for two reasons. One was to ensure that they wouldn't be around to lay claim to her fortune. The other was to satisfy his growing bloodlust. Rather than referring to the place where he committed his atrocities as a basement, Herman preferred to call it his lab in preparation for things to come, he had outfitted the rooms with see-through partitions, which allowed him to sit on the other side and observe his victims for hours on end. While money had always been his primary motivator, Herman had taken great pleasure in tormenting his captives before ending their lives. He would later admit that he would often lie in bed at night listening to their screams. If his wife heard them as well, she never let on. It was assumed that she was either an incredibly sound sleeper or a callous soul who had chosen to turn a deaf ear to the suffering taking place in her own backyard. Even if she had suspected that Herman was up to something, there was nothing to indicate that she had taken part in the killings. She knew that he traveled a good bit, supposedly in his capacity as a used furniture salesman, but had no reason to suspect that he was doing anything criminal. Considering that he had never done an honest day's work in his life, this was quite a stretch. Even so, it was probably easier to take him at his word than to allow herself to believe that the man she loved was luring women with the promise of marriage so he could bleed them dry, in more ways than one. The people of Clarksburg were up in arms when they learned about the killer in their midst, so much so in fact that they wanted to take matters into their own hands. Angry mobs would surround the courthouse and demand that they be allowed to give Herman the punishment he deserved. Things got so bad that the local fire department had to hold the crowd back with high-powered hoses. For his own protection, the prisoner was moved 80 miles away to the Moundsville State Penitentiary to await trial. While digging into his past, Authorities discovered that Herman had been a suspect in the murder of an acquaintance named Dudley Wade back in the days when he was living in Wisconsin. Although he had been the only person of interest in the case, there simply hadn't been enough evidence to charge him with the crime. It remains unsolved to this day. It was around this time that investigators also uncovered Herman's plethora of aliases. Besides Harry Powers and Cornelius Pearson, the lady killing chameleon had also used the names Joe Gildaw and A.R. Weaver at various stages of his criminal career. The murder trial of Herman Drenth got underway on December 7, 1931. In the days to come, a parade of witnesses would testify that the victims had been seen in his company just prior to their disappearances. Confident that he could sway the proceedings in his favor, Herman had taken the stand in his own defense. Unfortunately for him, the charm he had used successfully on dozens of lonely women had fallen flat in the courtroom. Five days after it began, the trial was over. After being found guilty of murder, he was sentenced to death by hanging. To say that life behind bars didn't suit Herman Trent would be a gross understatement. Still fancying himself an aristocrat, he complained bitterly of his ill treatment to anyone who would listen. By his account, the food was inedible. A decent night's sleep was impossible, and the other inmates and guards were mean to him. Needless to say, 
he received little sympathy from the warden who had to explain to him that death row was in the country club. As his execution date grew near, Herman recanted his confession, claiming that it had been beaten out of him. According to him, when he refused to sign a written statement taking responsibility for the abductions and murders, he was told that he would be handed over to the vigilante mob that was outside calling for his head. Again, his accusations were dismissed as the rantings of a desperate man who couldn't tell truth from lies. Justice was swift and on March 18, 1932, Herman Trent, aka Harry Powers, Cornelius Pearson and a host of others, was hanged by the neck until dead on the grounds of Moundsville State Prison. Herman had no last words as he was led to the scaffold. The entire process from start to finish had taken 11 minutes, a mercifully short time compared to the days, and possibly weeks, of suffering that his victims endured. He was 49 years old. Thank you for embarking on this harrowing journey into the depths of darkness with us, uncovering the twisted saga of Harry Powers, the Lonely Hearts Killer. As we conclude, let us remember the victims whose lives were tragically cut short, their dreams shattered by the ruthless actions of a merciless predator. May their stories serve as a somber reminder of the resilience of the human spirit and the importance of vigilance against those who seek to exploit trust and love. In honoring the memory of the fallen, we strive for a world where such malevolence finds no place, and where the bonds of genuine love and human connection prevail over the sinister shadows of deceit and cruelty.